Good morning, and welcome to Faith United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us online this morning. As we're getting ready to worship, we would ask that you would click on the I Attended button and register your attendance along with those that are with you this morning. Would you please stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And And also also with with you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all God's benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your infirmities. Redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with mercy. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. 
Amen. Our Psalter reading is Psalm 116, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of shale laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the course of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Our gospel reading is Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all that, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all of the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to, where, to which they were going, he walked ahead as if going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. He was at the table with them. He took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told them what happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Amen. 
Today we continue in our study of First Peter, which we began last week, and I have to tell you that I have been missing seeing your faces on Sunday mornings. Uh, we, we have uh, been doing this, of course, online, and we're getting used to, to worshiping and uh, trying to imagine you on the other side of the screen, uh, but this week, in, or, in order to just get a glimpse of your faces uh, pictures have been printed, and we have placed pictures on the chairs, and, um, and it's, so it is good this morning to see your si smiling faces in these pictures. Our passage this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. Listen for the word of God. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we come before you now as your beloved children seeking a word from you. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would teach us in this moment. God, we pray that our hearts would be open to receive the gift of your truth today. God, we pray that in receiving it, we would become the people that you dream for, for us to be as your word takes root in our hearts 
and grows and bears fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A favorite story of mine is uh, something that occurred in a conversation that I had with a friend of mine about six years ago. He's a friend of mine from California, and I had gone out to California to see him. He works for his family's company, which is a marketing firm, and he and I were sitting out uh, waiting for waves. We, he's also a surfer, and we were sitting waiting in between sets of waves talking together, and he shared with me that he had gone to Denmark in order to go to a storytelling conference. And the reason he went to a storytelling conference is because he believes that good marketing is virtually the same as good storytelling. And so he had gone to this conference in Denmark in order to hear the world's leading expert on storytelling. And this person who is considered to be such an expert is somebody who rarely makes public appearances. And so there was great anticipation within the crowd as they waited for this man to come out on stage and share his wisdom with, the, with them. The man finally came out onto the stage and he walked to the microphone. He had no notes with him. And he spoke into the microphone and said, story is home, challenge, new home. And then he walked off stage. I asked my friend, what happened next? And my friend shared with me that there was stunned silence, which was followed by a standing ovation. The crowd went wild because they had perceived that this man had shared with them in six words the essence of story. Home, challenge, new home. And it seems that if you think through your favorite stories, you will see that that outline is present in all good stories. Things begin here, they become challenged, and then they move to here. And we can see that in our own lives, as our own lives are somewhat of a story, and especially when we begin to live into the adventure of being in Christ, we find that our story transforms and becomes part of God's story. And so we can see in our own lives how that outline plays out. Home, challenge, new home. It seems that not long ago, we were enjoying life in a particular way, and life was somewhat predictable. It was home for us. And we had plans that we had made for the spring. We had uh, reservations for things that were set up for the summer. We were going through life, and life was what we considered to be normal. And we had things that we were planning to do that we, we have planned to do every year, and things that we looked forward to that we have looked forward to every year and every week. Things like the opening day of baseball. Things like Sunday morning worship. Things were rather normal. But then the COVID-19 pandemic swept across the globe, swept right into the United States and right into Texas, and it has thrown our lives into an upheaval. And all those things which seemed so predictable and so normal are now challenged. And now things that we have taken for granted so often are not necessarily going to be there in the future, or so it seems. And so things like how we shop, how we interact with each other, how we spend our day, how we are planning for the future, how we are worshiping, it is all challenged. It is all completely different than anything that we had expected or come to understand as normal. And so now it feels as though we are in that, that place of challenge. And as we are in this place of challenged, challenge, I have been reflecting on questions like, what are you up to, God? What is it that you want for us to learn in this experience? What do you want us to learn about ourselves and about each other and about you? And what are you bringing us toward as we move into the future? 
what do you want us to know? These are questions that uh, we could call questions of discernment. And when we are discerning the will of God in our lives, sometimes it is helpful for us to think through and ask the question, what biblical narrative might my life be playing out of right now? In what way is my life reflected in the scriptures? How do I see my life in the scriptures? Are there stories that I find in the Bible that seem to describe my experience right now? And as I've reflected on that, I have sensed that the Holy Spirit has moved me to think through the story of the Exodus. Uh, the story of the Exodus is a wonderful story. If you want to read about it, you can find it in the book of the Bible called Exodus. And in the, the book of Exodus, you hear this story. It, it kind of begins way back in Genesis, but we'll pick up with Joseph. Joseph was home and his brothers sold him into slavery, and he moved to Egypt where he faced lots and lots of challenges. But he became one who was in favor with Pharaoh and became uh, powerful and influential over Pharaoh's kingdom. Uh, as he was in that position, his brothers uh, had come from their homeland in order to find food because they were experiencing famine. And they ended up settling in Egypt, and their descendants remained in Egypt. We fast forward a, a quite a bit of time, and we find that the Israelites were living in Egypt. It was their home, but they were living under very difficult circumstances. They were pushed to labor intensely as slaves of Pharaoh, and it was horrible and awful. And so they cried to God, and God heard their cry. And he inspired Moses to lead them out of Egypt. And so Moses came and, and through a series of plagues, he was able to, to get the, the Israelites out of Egypt. They crossed through the Red Sea and they entered into the wilderness. And while they were in the wilderness, they experienced a great deal of challenge. It was God's dream for them that while they were in the wilderness that they would become a covenant people. And so he established a covenant with them where he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. He wanted for them to remain in the wilderness and so that they would be set apart as his people and so that while they were in the wilderness, they would come to understand what God's values are rather than their own values. He wanted for them to understand what it meant to be holy what it meant to be like God. And so they remained in the wilderness for 40 years. And the reason they stayed in the wilderness for 40 years was not because they were lost, not because they didn't know where it was that God was wanting to take them, which was back to Canaan. It was because God wanted them to remain in the wilderness. And in time, God then brought them into the promised land, into their new home. Their story went from home to challenge in the wilderness to their new home. From Egypt, wilderness, promised land. And it seems that in a certain sense, we are also in a, in a similar place as the Israelites were when they were in the wilderness. That it is not some place that we really want to be in, but it is a place where God takes us in order to shape us and to form us into his people and to prepare us for what lies next. It seems that Peter, writing to these churches that he writes to in the book of First Peter, is writing to people who are also between home and new home, and so he writes to encourage them while they are in that experience of challenge. And so he tells them, and I think he is, that God is also telling us some things that are important for us to hear, things which were important for them to hear. And so Peter says to them, therefore, prepare your minds for action. He's reminding them that while they are in this 
stage in their life of challenge that it is really about being prepared for what comes next. He wants for the people, God wants for the people to prepare their minds for what God wants them to do next. It continues and says, discipline yourselves. Discipline yourselves. Uh, Discipline is vital to becoming the people of God. If we are undisciplined, then we are nothing like God because God is very disciplined. We are also called to be disciplined. And for us in this time in which we are in this season of challenge, it is vital for us to lean into the spiritual disciplines of prayer, scripture, fasting, generosity, acts of kindness. This is a perfect time for us to lean into those disciplines. I read earlier this week that somebody refer, is referring to this time as the great pause. This is a season for us to get a break from the rat race. It is, it is a time in which we have more time with our families than we probably ever have or ever will. But it is a perfect opportunity for us to lean into those spiritual disciplines that in other times in our life we have said, I don't have enough time for that right now. Now we have the time. And so it is time for us to be disciplined and to lean into those spiritual disciplines. It continues and says, set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. We are being reminded that our hope is not in going back to where we used to be. The hope that we are being challenged to embrace is the hope of what Jesus is bringing next. The hope is not to move back to normal. The hope is to move into new normal. The hope is what Jesus is about to reveal. Set your hope on that. It continues and says, Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Some of us, when we get stressed out in life, We will fall back into old habits and old patterns that are not necessarily good for us. When we become anxious, we often will resort to habits and practices which are not necessarily God's best intention for us. This is a time when we need to be conformed not to those old things, but to be conformed into the things of God, the things that God wants us to be about. Or to put it another way, as Peter does in verse 15, instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Holiness is the goal of grace. God showers his grace on our lives. He brings us into relationship with him and he works in our lives by the power of his Holy Spirit for the goal of making us holy, which means that he is, by his grace, he is working in our lives with the goal of making us more and more like Christ. We are not to be conformed to those old things, but to be conformed into Christ, to be conformed to God's will and God's purposes and God's values question for us to ask is when the world looks at us and when the world looks at the church, does the world see people who are living according to the values of God and the values of holiness? When the world looks at us, does it see us living to the values of love and peace and generosity and kindness? Or does it see a people who, while claiming to be the people of God, bear little resemblance to the character of God? This season, this wilderness season, is for us an opportunity to become holy. It is an opportunity for us to reclaim the new covenant of Jesus Christ, to claim the salvation that Christ has brought for us, 
It is a time for us to be prepared. It is a time for us to be conformed into the likeness of Christ. I want to challenge you that when you hear people say, when will we get back to normal? Remind yourself that God is not leading us backward. God is leading us forward to our new home. God does not want us to fall backward. God wants us to move forward. And I also want to challenge you that when you feel the weight of all of this season pressing down on you, that you remember that God has so much more in store for us than we can possibly imagine. That what God is doing right now is preparing us for that new and wonderful vision that he gives us in Scripture. And that what God is doing is he is leading us in the wilderness. And this is where he wants us. He wants us right here in the wilderness. We will not remain in the wilderness forever. We will not remain in this season of the COVID-19 forever. But let's not waste this wilderness experience. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to move in our lives and to prepare us for what is next as we move from home into wilderness or into challenge to new home. Take heart. Be encouraged. God is with us, and he is leading us to what is next. Amen. My darkness, Jesus found me, touched my eyes and made me see, broke sin's chains that long had bound me, gave me life and liberty. love of Christ my Lord divine that made him stoop to save a soul like mine through all my days and then in heaven above my song will silence never I'll worship him forever him for his glorious love. Oh, amazing truth to ponder, how whom an angel host attend, Lord of heaven, God's Son, what one.
you join me in prayer? O oh, ancient of days, the songs that are on our hearts shall never cease, O oh God. We shall worship you forever. For in fact, God, your word says, if we cease doing that, the rocks will cry out. And God, we don't want rocks in our objects to cry out in our stead, but rather, God, we want to be able to worship you in spite of. God, the worship doesn't start stop because we are in wilderness, God. And in fact, what, what ought to happen is that this situation, God, ought to be causing us to worship you even a little more. For in fact, when Moses wanted to, to go off, he told Pharaoh, let me go so that I may worship Yahweh the Lord in the wilderness. And God, here we are in this wilderness experience. And we just want to say thank you and we love you. God, our situation doesn't change who you are. It doesn't change your goodness. It doesn't change your grace. It doesn't change your love. It doesn't change your very nature. For you are still the great I am. You are still the great Jehovah Jireh. You are still all that you say in your word, that everlasting water. And so, God, we just want to say thank you in the midst of. Even though we have things that we, we can be sad about, things we can be anxious and stressed about, God, the very fact that we are alive and breathing and the very fact that we serve a very real and living God is enough to say thank you. Oh, God, just sit high but you dwell low and we thank you for that, oh, God. We just ask that in this season, whatever you're doing, God, whatever you're doing, you won't do it without us. That, Lord, you will show us and reveal to us the plan. If it's bringing a revival and a reformation to your church, so, God, we ask that you would allow it to be so. Allow your Holy Spirit to fall afresh on every household, God, that's watching this, on every home in America, on every home in this world where Christians are gathering together and they're saying, what is my God doing? May your Holy Spirit find itself there. God, because we know even after the resurrection, when the doors were locked and the doors were closed and people were shut in in fear, God, still your Holy Spirit, your, your son, Jesus the Christ, showed up and showed out. And he said, if you don't believe me, put your hand right here. Touch and see that I am real. And so, Lord, in this time, we ask that you would just have your way. That you would be with our first responders. That you would be with those who are on the front lines putting their and their family's health at risk. We ask for those who are experiencing loss during this time, God, that you can provide them the hope of the resurrection as Paul writes about in verse 15 and that we learn about in the cross. And God, as we are in this wilderness experience, May we find ourselves in that place that the Israelites did, having trekked for three days with no water, coming to this certain pool of water, finding it bitter, and there Moses throwing the wood in and making it sweet. Oh, how that cross, that old red cross, turns our bitter situation sweet. Lord, we just want to say that we love you. We ask that you would hear every cry that comes up. We know you collect every tear. Your word says it. God, teach us to be holy in this time. Teach us to be focused on you in this time. And teach us, oh God, how we can wander in this wilderness, trekking towards the promised land, whatever that may be. God, we give you control and total control. We ask that your Holy Spirit will pray for us and be in us and lead us and guide us. Just as that cloud by day and the fire by night did the same for the Hebrews in the wilderness. This we pray in your son's name. Amen. Now may you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now will you join me in our affirmation of faith? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. As we continue our worship with our gifts and offerings, I want to remind you that uh, you can give electronically by going to our homepage at www.faithumc.org, and you'll see a button there that says online giving. There's several ways to uh, give online, and you can even set up recurring gifts that make it more convenient. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, in this time we are ever reminded that uh, we are simply stewards of the gifts that you have given us, whether it be great or whether it be meager, we are to be faithful with those gifts. We are called to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Almighty God. In this strange time, we're finding new ways to create disciples. We're finding new ways to reach people, to engage parents with their children and teens. Almighty God, give us your discernment and your wisdom as we find ways to make disciples and bring heaven here on earth as we're instructed. We give thanks to you and we ask you to bless what we receive, give us discernment on how best to use it in your ministry. Amen.
you to pray with me our prayer of thanksgiving. All things come from you, O God, and with praise and thanksgiving we return to you what is yours. You created all that is and with love formed us in your image. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You gave your only son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior that we might have abundant and eternal life. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so, in gratitude for all that you have done, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ offering for us. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen like to extend to you an invitation that if something has stirred within you during worship this morning and you would like to talk with a pastor about it, we would love for you to give us an email. And if, if you'll do that, we will be in contact with you. It may be that you have decided that you would like to receive Jesus into your heart and to accept him as your Lord and Savior. We would love to pray with you about your decision to follow Jesus if you would want to email us we will begin that conversation with you. If this morning you have been moved to want to join Faith United Methodist Church, please email us and we will talk with you about next steps. We stand for our closing hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Receive this benediction. May the love of the Father and the friendship of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.